Uh, my name is Daniel. I am one of the pastors and elders here at Alathia Church. Kiddos, if you are of elementary school age and you would like to go to class today, you can follow your teachers out the back door uh, that way. Uh, if you're new with us, let me say welcome. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to have you here with us. If there's anything uh, we can do for you, please let us know. Uh, I will only ask two things of you today. Uh, number one is uh, don't fall asleep during my sermon, and if you do, don't snore. Uh, and number two, uh, connect with us in some way, shape, or form. And you can do that in one of three ways, by coming up and saying hi to me after service, or at the end of service, there will be a QR code that you can scan and fill out a digital form to connect. Or if you like doing that in person, you can go out to the welcome desk and they can help get you connected further into the life of Alathia Church. All right, the time has come for us to enter into the very first sermon of Lamentations. I can feel the excitement. Yes, for the last four weeks, we have taken you through the process of lament, what it means to be lament, to, to, what it means to lament, how unique it is for Christians to lament, as we've taken you through four psalms. But today, we do enter into the book of Lamentations for the first of four Sundays. And to help put us into the place of Jeremiah the prophet, as he is looking at the city of, of Jerusalem today, I, I want to help, I want to do a little thought exercise, because by having you imagine your favorite place on planet Earth, all right? The, the place that you love more than any other, okay? Where you have incredible experiences, where you have incredible relationships, where you, you're just like, man, I love going to this place. And maybe it's Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. If you were a student back in the 90s and, you know, when things were really good around here, right? That was for Kevin this morning. He always takes a shot. Uh, maybe it's Exact Tech Arena. Maybe it is your dorm room where you've had some incredible conversations with people. Maybe it's your favorite coffee shop. Maybe it's the home you grew up in. Uh, if you're my wife, hands down, it's Disney. I mean, it's just hands down, that, that's where it is. So do you have that place in your mind? You got it? You got the memories associated with it? Now, what if tonight you, uh, you went to bed and tomorrow morning, that place that you woke up looked like this up on the screen? Now, it's only by the power of modern technology that a bomb can immediately take a city or a building and leave it looking like this in an instant. But yet, this is a scene actually much worse that Jeremiah himself was, was walking into and looking at and had experienced over many years as Nebuchadnezzar had laid siege to the city of Jerusalem and had destroyed everything. He finds himself in a city that he no longer recognizes. A city once set upon a hill adorned with the temple of the living God is now leveled and in utter ruin. The homes of his dearest and closest friends have been burned to the ground. Each home emptied not only of its possessions, but the entire city emptied of its people who have been carried off to a foreign land where nothing is their own. And it is with this that we open up and we see the first two verses of Lamentations, how lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become, she who was great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks among all her lovers. She has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her they have become her enemies. Now, the original title of this book in Hebrew was not Lamentations, but in fact, it was another singular word, a three-letter word, how. This is how Jeremiah introduces the book of Lamentations, is with this word, and this is how the people of his day who would have read this letter they, they would have understood this is what Jeremiah is getting at. This underlies the entire foundation of the entire letter that he is writing is that he begins with this word, how. 
And so we're going to begin this morning by asking, how did we get to this point in the biblical story where the city of God is destroyed and the children of God have been displaced and carried off as refugees to a foreign land? So we're going to start all the way from the beginning in Genesis 1-1 and get all the way to 586 B.C., in a few short minutes. God creates the world and He declares everything in it to be very good in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 3, man and woman introduce sin into the world. And with the coming of sin comes destruction and death. A few chapters later, God in His faithfulness to humanity calls out to a guy named Abram who he changes his name to Abraham. And he says, Abraham, you are going to be the father of my people. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons who are, in fact, the 12 tribes of Israel. And it is to these 12 tribes that God gives the promised land. The promised land is in the vicinity of modern-day Israel, and He gives them this land, and it comes with an opportunity and a warning. Look at what God says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His ways, and by keeping His commandments and His statutes and His rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying His voice, and holding fast to Him, for He is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Now this proclamation gets made around 1400 B.C. This is when Joshua takes the children of Israel across the Jordan for the very first time of the Promised Land. And from here we enter into the book of Judges, and the book of Judges is a 400-year period in the history of Israel. And in the book of Judges, we see this pattern on the screen repeated over and over and over again, where Israel serves the Lord, where Israel then falls into sin and idolatry. Israel gets enslaved. Israel cries out to the Lord. God raises up a judge. Israel is delivered, and then Israel serves the Lord again. And they repeat this over and over and over for 400 years, till finally at the end of 400 years, the people go to the prophet Samuel and they say, we want a king just like all the other nations. And old Sammy says to them, guys, this is going to go really bad. But God has said, I will give you what you want. So God gives them a king, and this king is named Saul. Saul sins grievously against God, so God replaces him with a young shepherd boy named David. Whenever you think David, think 1000 B.C. That's a good marker in the Scripture. And so David rises to power in Israel. Israel becomes a great force, and his son Solomon takes Israel to the highest heights it's ever had uh, on this earth where there was wealth, there were treasures, there were buildings. It was an incredibly prosperous time. Rulers came from all over the world just to seek Solomon's wisdom and to talk to Solomon. So this is about 950 BC. And after Solomon dies, his sons make a mess of everything. And so from 950 BC all the way to 722 BC, there's the kingdom splits where you have Israel, and which we call Israel as the 11 tribes of the north, and Judah, the lowly tribe left in the south. And so finally in 722 BC, the nation of Assyria comes in from the north and overruns Jerusalem, I mean overruns the, 12, the 11 tribes of Israel, and they are then scattered in what we call the diaspora. At this point, God brings prophets onto the scene like Micah and Habakkuk and Jeremiah and Isaiah, and he's saying, repent, 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 or Judah, the exact same thing is going to happen to you. 
And so finally, just before 600 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar begins laying siege to Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he lays siege for many years till eventually he breaks down the wall, he burns down the city, he destroys the temple of God, and he takes everyone inside of Jerusalem and he displaces them into Babylon, leaving only a few people behind. And this event we call the exile. And it is at this point, at this moment in time, this is what Jeremiah is seeing. He is standing in the city, much like the image you saw on the screen. He is looking over the city of Jerusalem, and he is trying to come to grips with how did this happen? How did this come to be? Now, I will point out, since I know this is, this is graduation weekend, correct? Congratulations to all of you who did, who made it. If you're a Christian, you've ever graduated from high school or college, then I can almost guarantee at some point some other Christian gave you a card with these words on it. For I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord. Plans to anybody? Did anybody ever receive this card at any graduation? All right. Just so you know, there's incredible irony in this verse because Jeremiah says this to the people of Israel, the ones living in Judah, right before the exile. So please do not miss the irony that whoever gave you that card has now wished you well into the exile of the workforce for the next 70 years. All right? That's how it was delivered to you. So good luck, especially in these days of inflation. But another sermon, another time. Um, I give you all of this background for one main reason is because when, when we come to passages like this uh, over the next four weeks, many people are going to walk away concluding this about God, that God is mean, cruel, and vindictive towards children that He claims to love. Some conclude that God is powerless to stop evil. Some conclude that God does not exist because a good God will never allow this to happen. But if you take the long view over what has happened over 800 years from 1400 B.C. when they entered into the Promised Land to the exile in 586 B.C., I think you can see that God is patient, long-suffering in His love, and merciful to a people who constantly fill the land with idolatry, injustice, immorality, and corruption. And so as we move into the first two chapters of Lamentations, let me point out one more thing that's not obvious to us in the English translation. Jeremiah writes chapter 1 as a complete acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet, and then he goes on to write chapter 2 as an, a complete acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, in case you have forgotten what an acrostic is, it's just something very simple like our alphabet, that if I was to write something and the first line was, a, like apples are good, and then B, boys are bad, C, cats are dumb. I mean, like all the way, right? Like I could just go on and on and on. So Jeremiah does this as a literary device through the, in, dogs are great, by the way. Um, Jeremiah does this all the way through for two chapters. Now, another thing you need to know is there's two literary devices being used here. One is the acrostic. The acrostic serves as a point to show that the suffering and the pain and the devastation is totally complete from A to Z. And not only does he do it once, but he does it twice to really let you know that he's driving home his point. The same way that when Jesus talks to people and he says, truly, truly, anytime Jesus says these two words, he is really emphasizing to you, I'm about to make a point you really need to pay attention. So anytime you're reading scripture and you see repetition, that is the writer, that is the Holy Spirit, that is God himself trying to really draw your attention to a point. So this is, this is really important how Jeremiah sets this entire thing up in Lamentations 1, 1 through 5. So quickly, let's go through these first five verses right here. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become, she who was great among the nations, she who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks among all her lovers. She has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. 
She dwells now among the nations, but finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for none had come to the festival. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her virgins have been afflicted, and she herself suffers bitterly. Her foes have become the head, her enemies prosper, because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. Israel is portrayed as a broken, lonely widow and princess now a slave. The city weeps, having been abandoned by her former lovers and opposed by friends. The once glorious nation is now scattered with no resting place. She has been overrun by her adversaries and her enemies prosper. And the people are left with this question, how did this happen? And in the midst of asking this question, verse 5 gets really uncomfortable. When Jeremiah directly states that the cause behind the grief is because the Lord has afflicted her. Jeremiah has no problem identifying Babylon as the means and God is the one who ultimately orchestrated the destruction of Jerusalem. And to further his claim, look at Lamentations chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Now let me point out to you, this is actually eight verses from verse 1 through verse 8. I'll only read two for you. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the habitations of Jacob. In his wrath, he has broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn from them his right hand in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. And it is here in this moment that we are forced to wrestle with this great tension between the presence of pain and the sovereignty of God, especially as it relates to his own children. But I want you to think about it for a moment. Despite being God's chosen people and the object of his covenant love, the kingdom of Judah reached a point where the scales of divine justice tipped over. God leveled his own temple. He scattered his own people. He ruined his own city. Judah believed they could do whatever they wanted to with God's, right, God's commandments. They were dismissive of God's rule in their life. It led to this moment. Their sinfulness led to their brokenness. The message is clear. The people are facing the judgment of God because of their sin. And it's here we need to step outside of Lamentations just for a moment and address the, the nature and the character of God for a moment. Please with me turn to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. The prophet Isaiah, in around 750 B.C., writes these words. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! For I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people un of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now what we must point out in this verse, and what you must take away from this verse, and there's a very similar verse in Revelation chapter 4, is this use of describing the nature of God as holy, holy, holy. Hopefully you haven't forgotten what I just taught you about the Scripture repeating itself. You need to know and understand for the rest of your life that God's most defining attribute is His holiness. This is the only thing in all of Scripture that is repeated in triplicate. 
God is never described as love, 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 mercy, 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 or grace, grace, grace. He is only ever described in triplicate as holy, holy, holy. And this, we as a people must remember when we are engaging with the world, when we are walking out in our own exile in this life, that God's most defining attribute is His holiness. And when we use the word holy, it's, it literally means separate or set apart. The illustration I always use and give to people is your toothbrush. Okay. Your toothbrush is set apart, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you use your toothbrush for anything else? Do you scrub the floors with it and put it in your mouth? Anybody? Please don't admit if you do. Clean a toilet with it and put it in your mouth? No. It is set apart. It's off to the side. You make sure nothing happens to it. You make sure it stays clean. And if it gets dirty, what do you do with it? It's gone, right? Your toothbrush is holy. Let this serve as an illustration for you every time you brush your teeth for the rest of your life. In the same way, the, the idea being communicated here that I'm trying to get to is that, is that when we're talking about God's holiness, we're talking about His absolute purity. He is unstained by sin and evil. He is perfect in every way and perfectly good all the time. Everything He does and says is right and holy. This means that the moral code we find in Scripture, the commands for how God's people are to conduct themselves, are a reflection of His holy nature. They are not there to rob us of joy or prevent us from living a life, a life, living a full and complete life. God gives His commands for our good to help us pursue holiness. God's commands show us His expectations for humanity, the standard of what it means to be holy from God's perspective, even as they show us how far short we fall from those standards. Because not only is God holy, but He also calls us to be holy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, Peter says, But as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. The Bible tells us in Romans that mankind has fallen short of God's glory. The result of this sinful rebellion is death. The effect of our collective treason is the groaning of creation under this brokenness. We, along with the entire created order, long for a better day. Therefore, we need to understand that beneath every painful aspect of our humanity is the reality of sin. And sin is a violation of God's holiness. The point that I want to drive home to you today, that Jeremiah is driving home in the book of Lamentations, is that sin is the real problem. Sin is the real issue that we are all dealing with. It is the foundational issue that, is, that causes all of the pain and suffering in the world, and all of our pain and all of our suffering here in this life. And so we need to make sure that when we are trying to address the problems in this world and the problems in our life, that, that we look and address where sin might be present. When we sin, the consequences will always be felt in our life at some point. Like today, if after church, one of you gets the wild idea that it's a good idea to go rob a bank, um, you might get away with it for 24 hours, but eventually law enforcement is going to catch up to you somewhere uh, and you're going to end up in jail, or you can do a true Florida man, jump in some water and get eaten by an alligator, right? Those are, those are one of your two most likely ends. Those would be consequences you would experience very quickly if you went and robbed a bank. Now, if you're a really good, sharp, and devious accountant, maybe you can cook the books for about 10 or 15 years uh, stealing money from your company, and it might be a long time before you actually feel and experience the consequences of the wrong that you have done. Whether you experience in a very short amount of time, a very long amount of time, the Bible is very clear, and our own life experience is very clear, that when we do wrong, the consequences of that wrong will eventually catch up to us. 
And here's what you need to realize when the consequences of your sin catch up with you. God is issuing to you a spiritual wake-up call. He has finally said enough. He has orchestrated life in such a way in His sovereignty that He's trying to get your attention so that you would stop your running from Him and turn to Him. And I think it is so important that we see what Jeremiah does in chapter 18 of Lamentations chapter 1, just in the first two lines. The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against His word. This right here is one of the most important things you could ever do in your life is to admit that God is right in all of His ways. And when you see that you have not done right in His ways, you confess that your sin is actually rebellion. Do not be like the PR speech you see from famous people all the time, when after having committed the most grievous and heinous of sins, they say these words, I made a mistake. You did not make a mistake. You rebelled against a holy God. When we sin, we do, though it may be a mistake, that is not the biggest, most foundational issue. The the, the true issue is that sin is a rebellion against God. And God treats our sin with a really big deal, right? I mean, Adam and Eve committed one sin. Like, think about it. All the pain and suffering that has existed for however many years the earth has been here since their sin is all due to someone eating an apple. Really a piece of fruit, but we call it an apple. Sorry for you who only get. And so it is here, as we acknowledge our sin, and we say, okay, God, you've got my attention. You are right. I have, I have rebelled against you. This is where the process of lament begins. And so for four weeks, we've covered this process as turn to God, issue your complaint to God, make a request to God, and trust to God. But let me, let me show you how there's that process of lament But that's really only dealing with lament in one direction. If you notice over the last four weeks as we dealt with these issues, when when David would turn to God and issue his complaint, it was because of some injustice being committed against him. He, He was complaining that he was being sinned against. And it's here that, yes, you should complain and then make the request of God, God, get me out of this mess. Please come save me. Please be true to your word. I'm putting my trust in you. But that's different than when you've sinned, right? Because when you've sinned, I'll just be honest, you complaining to God about the situation you put yourself in is just not really the pattern that we're going for here, right? Nor is God. So actually, we're going to replace that first C word with another C word, where when we recognize it's our sin, we turn to God, we then we confess to God. This is what Jeremiah does here. He realizes he's confessing on behalf of the people that we have sinned against you. And then once you have sinned again, once you confess this, then you make your request to God for forgiveness. It's okay. If you get yourself in really hot water, it's okay to ask God to restore you. It's okay for God to to ask God, God, give me some restitution for for, for what I've done. He's probably going to make you walk back through it for a long time so that you hopefully don't repeat the lesson because if you know anything about humanity from reading the Bible, your own experience, we're not very quick to actually change, right? These this thing we have in here called the heart, um, it kind of likes doing its own thing. It kind of likes going its own way. And anytime it has a desire and wants to do something that's its own way that goes against what God has told it to do, it doesn't always like to listen. I'm trying, Michael. I'm trying to preach. So we turn to God. We confess our sin. We make a request to God 
and we trust in His forgiveness and His restoration. And church, we must remember that when we confess our sin to God, when we turn and we confess and we ask for forgiveness, we have this verse in Scripture. One of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's an amazing verse. Now, please do know this, that it does, it does not say that he then takes away all of our problems or the consequences of all the things that we've done. But he does say he forgives us and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You know, this, like, this, this is the gospel, right? The, the, the gospel, the, this whole thing that, that God sets into motion all the way back from Genesis chapter 3, from when Adam and Eve sinned, we see the heart of God toward humanity when He issues what we famously call in, in seminary and theological circles the proto-evangelion, right? The first gospel. The first gospel is that, hey, one day a woman is going to bear a child that is going to crush the head of the serpent. The gospel is preached right there, and we see the gospel proclaimed throughout the entire Old Testament, becoming full reality when Jesus tabernacles among us, when God Himself takes on flesh so that He could, as the perfectly righteous one, become the substitute for our unrighteousness. We call it the great exchange, right? So when, when Jesus is there in the trial before Bar- with Barabbas and the, the Pharisees is there with um, Pilate and they're saying, give us Barabbas, like let Barabbas go. This is the great exchange. This is exactly what Jesus does for you and me. He does it literally there, but figuratively for us, but no less real where he exchanges himself by putting himself upon the cross to atone for your sin and for my sin and for the sins of the world, for all who would come to believe that He is the Christ. And so we see in this the love of God. We see the disposition of God to where He wants to redeem and and to rescue. He wants the best for us. And His commandments are there for us to obey, to give us a completely joy-filled life. The only one, and Kevin talks about this all the time, the only one, the the greatest robber of my joy is me. The greatest robber of your joy is you. When you choose to rebel against God and to do things your way rather than what God commands you to do. So if you want to be happy, if you want to be full of joy, then do as the Lord your God has commanded you and obey His commandments. Because God does love you with an incredibly fierce love, but He's not going to compromise His standards. He's not going to say, oh, well, okay, that's fine if you want to do it. It's like, no, this is going to end badly for you. I created you. I created the whole world. I know how this works. I know how this ends. I exist outside of time. That's why every day is like, the same for me because he time is this line and God exists outside of all of it. He can see the beginning. He can see the end. He experiences all at once. He wants you to repent because he wants what's best for you. And we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 21, I, I specifically read that verse out of 1 Peter 1 for you in verse 15, because I wanted to come to it um, and read it in detail. Also because, hey, we just went to the book of John, right? And who do we spend so much time talking about at the end? Peter, right? Remember Peter denies Jesus? I mean, if there's anybody who wasn't going to get their sins forgiven, it was this guy, right? I mean, He, like told him that, like, I don't even know the guy. Like, he was so scared, he wouldn't even admit it to an elementary school girl. Like, you were with Jesus. No, I wasn't. Like, that's how scared he was in that moment. I mean, 
That's all Jesus meant to him. Like, no, I'm going to deny him. And it's that guy. Remember, we saw him restored. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep, right? Complete restoration. I mean, ter- terrible sin against the one who he confessed was the Christ. And now we see a few years later. And, and this, this is the hope for you and me, right? If you're sitting here today and you are being weighed down by your sin, and it has got you all messed up on the inside, or if one day you find yourself having sinned grievously against people and against God, let this passage be of incredible encouragement to you of what God can do for a life and to a life who has sinned grievously against Him, but yet restore that life and use that life for the good of the kingdom and for the salvation of many others. This is why no one is beyond hope. Because the same guy who denied Jesus, it says this to us in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now again, I think it's very interesting here. Peter doesn't go back, oh, the grace you once received. Well, where And Peter got some big grace in that moment back in John. But what is the grace that Peter is telling us to look forward to? The future revelation of Jesus when He comes and He makes all things new. And he says, as obedient children... Do not be conformed in this life to the passions of your former ignorance. But as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on Him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. See, the people of Israel did not conduct themselves with fear. They did not fear God at all. They feared the man, men around them. They feared these gods that didn't really exist. They feared all those things, but they did not fear Yahweh. And because of that, they were sent into exile. But we as Christians know that now upon this life, as we await the revelation of Jesus, we are in our exile because we are called aliens and strangers in this land. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And so we wrap up the sermon today. I come to you as one of your pastors and elders not wanting you to find yourself in a place like the city of Jerusalem as Jeremiah looked over. Because this is what I can promise you. If you have sin in your life, whether it be open rebellious sin or hidden sin, if you keep this sin, it will eventually bring you to ruin and destruction. I do not want that for you. God does not want that for you. Your community group does not want that for you. But if you continue in your ways, if you continue in your rebellion, this is what will eventually happen to you. You will find your life in a whole heap of mess and rubble. But please do know if you ever find yourself in that place, God will always take you back. No matter how far you run, no matter how much you rebel, it's incredible the love that He has for us. That we would spurn His love and His affection and His goodness 
But yet when we finally realize the error of our ways, He takes us right back. And not only does he take us back, but the Bible says he casts our sin as far as from the east as from the west. Like he doesn't even remember your sin. Have you, have you ever just like done, like just taken some time to think about that? Like there is, he didn't even remember it. Like I got a really good list. Anybody else? And by not remember it, means he does, he's not going to hold it against you. He's not just going to hold over you. Nope, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did No. That's not who God is. Again, He disciplines those that He loves. Hebrews, right? He does discipline His children. But He's not disciplining us because He's holding our sin over our head. He disciplines us because He's conforming us to the image of Jesus. And I'm just going to tell you, that's painful. That's painful whether you are good or bad. Becoming like Jesus is hard. And we can't do it apart from the Spirit's work inside of us. A testimony to God's faithfulness to His mission, which is to see the gospel in the likeness of His death and raised to walk in newness of life.